Christophe Morange, or Chris Morange, I am Professor of Physical Geography, Coastal Geomorphology, and Geoarchaeology in ex Marseille University, so mainly on the Mediterranean border in southern France, and I belong to CEREG, Center of Research in Geoscience, it's a geological center mainly dedicated to geochemistry, paleoenvironments, and in connection with another biological laboratory, EMBE, Mediterranean Institute of Biology and Ecology. It's a big, important group in southern France for geoscience so, research. We have to be for a few days together. We will, uh, before beginning the subject of the different disasters, I think it's because we are a class with different backgrounds, it's important to, to, to think about the context of the Mediterranean and not only to focus too much of, because you present yourself, you present uh, your research, so, sometimes it's very speci speci specialized, and I think it's always very important in research and science to, to understand what is the context of the research, why and what are the questions. So for the two next hours until the lunch, I will try to to put some souvenir of the Mediterranean Sea and some information dealing with, um, with uh, hazards, paleo hazards in mind. Sorry for people who know everything, but I think it was important. So it's um, easy to be contacted via email, no problem. And you can find the, 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 the paper of my team on two portal academia of research case. First of all, what is most important when you make a master or a PhD, what not the most important, but one important thing is the bibliography and the good bibliography, good reference to be uh, aware of the state of the art. Okay, so I, I, I came with three references. I can send you a tsunami of references. The first, the first book you should know, you should use as a, let's say, a Bible, is by Jamie Woodward, who was the editor in 2009, six years ago, about a book called The Physical Geography of the Mediterranean Sea. It's published in Oxford. It's more than 600 pages. It's absolutely fundamental. And there is a chapter dedicated to natural hazards. Volcanic hazards, seismic hazards, tsunami and, and storminess, etc. Uh, high frequency fluid. So this is absolutely very important to buy it or to use it in the library. The second book I recommend is by Grove and Rackham. Grove and Rackham are two English biologists. They published, okay, it's 15 years ago, but they published a very nice book called The Nature of Mediterranean Europe. It's mainly biogeographical approach, but it's a very interesting uh, book, especially because Grove and Rackham has worked a lot in Greece and mainly in Creta and there are a lot of examples from Greece. So I think for people interested in Greece and Greek people it's important to, to know this book. And the third book is more recent, it's from last year. It's what we will do with Matteo during these two or three days. On book of sea level research, published by Shenan. Shenan is professor at Durham University in England and with colleagues he is he has edited this important book published by the American AGU, American Geophysical Union, in 600 pages. All the methodology dealing with sea level research is included in this book. If you read this book, if you use it, you don't need to, to read uh, a lot more. So, if it's three references, you are free to begin to think and to ask questions about nature and connection between nature, society, and uh, vulnerability. These are the first page of the three books. Also, there is something important in geomorphology because we will deal during these days with geomorphology and geoarchaeology. There is a beautiful encyclopedia of two volumes that was published by Andrew Gaudi, who was a very important uh, professor in England. Oh, okay, it's 10 years old, but it's two volumes. Yeah. You can find it on the internet for free. Uh, or I can. I have in my uh, laptop. 
I will try to, to solve it. After, you have some tool to work. For example, okay, it's mainly in French, but you have the European database. So if you read French, you have what we call DEL, PhD online. I checked it two days ago, there is 60,000 PhD online free access. For uh, Europe, you go to DART. DART, Europe, Europe, Europe. There is 600,000 PhD online. It's the collection of all the national library dealing with PhD. Okay, so it's in different languages. It's mainly in Italian, in Spanish, in French, and also in English. So please use this tool to, to progress in your research. So, the first lecture is <coughs> dedicated to geological souvenir of the Mediterranean Sea. So I have just put, in order to not forget them, a few dates. First of all, we have to remember that the Mediterranean Sea is the, is the daughter of an old ocean called Tethys, and this old ocean is the old 300 million years with the fracturation of Pangea, a monotectonic block, 300 million years ago. Since 80 million years ago, we have, uh, after this opening of Tethys, we have the closure of Tethys. And the, the collision between Africa and Europe. And the collision between Africa and Europe, first, is due to the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, but all the consequences are absolutely very fundamental to understand the connection between society and nature, because, for example, the closure of the DC at the origin of volcanism in the Mediterranean Sea, of seismicity, of uh, tsunami hazard, of uh, orography, Alp, Pyrenees, etc., of island formation, like the tectonic rotation of Corsica and Sardinia. So all the landscape, most of all the landscape, most of all the impact, most of all the vulnerability and the paleoasa of the Mediterranean Sea is due to this very long geological story of more, of more than 80 million years ago. So it's a long story, a long geological story. And let's take an example. The, during the Messinian uh, desiccation uh, uh, event, when the Mediterranean Sea was disconnected from the Atlantic Ocean, why? Because there is a collision between Morocco, Paleo-Morocco, and Paleo-Spain. So this is between 5.8 and 5.3, and I put, for example, for the archaeologists, a very important uh, volcanic eruption of Santorini with the caldera collapse 3,600 years BP, or for the Italian team, the famous uh, Vesuvius eruption, 79 AD. So, just in this introduction of the introduction, I will present some watercolor that I have produced with a friend to produce a book, uh, just to, to remember the result. At least 10, 10 slides. I will, I will go quickly to progress. Just to remember that the opening of the 300,000, 300 million years ago of Pangea, Laurasia on the north, Gondwana on the south, including Australia, Antarctica, Africa, and South America is the, the discovery of this tectonic evolution is very recent. It was impossible to imagine one century ago that the reality, the tectonic mobility of the Earth was like this. It was impossible. The, the, the continents were, were, were analyzed as moving uh, iceberg. And it was only the German that 80 years ago that was uh, 
<laughs> analyzing the ice, the, the ice melting, and have the idea of uh, drift, of drift, with the famous Professor Wegner, who was not a geologist. That is important. He was a climatologist, and it's always uh, you must be aware that not most, but part of the results are not from the scientists from their own field, but from <coughs> outside. So don't be shy or don't be afraid to be an outsider of your discipline and not, and not to be always an insider. So this is the first, this is the first uh, step of the opening of Paleotetis 300 million years ago with a crustal extension. It's a rift. It's like the Great Rift in Eastern Africa. It's like the Dead Sea transformed fault with the Dead Sea and the Galilee Sea between Israel, Syria, and Palestine and Jordania with the extension. But, as I told you, 200 million years later, with the opening of the South Atlantic Ocean, there is a rotation. Alors, of course, there is plenty of debate. I give you the date of 80 million years, but for colleagues, it's 180 million years, because it's step by step, and there is a big debate in the geological community about the timing. It's, let's say, 100 million years ago, but there is a rotation of Africa versus northeast at the origin of ice seismicity in, for example, in Italy, uh, Greece, Turkey, and the Levant. The opening and the subduction of the African plate below the Eurasian plate is, for example, the origin of the moving, of the tectonic moving, since 13 million years of the Corso Sar microplate. And, for example, if you go to southern France, you will see some <coughs> rheolitic cliff volcanic red reality cliff close to Nice, to Nizza, called the Estere Coast, that are exactly the same geological outcrop of Scandola in uh, the western coast of Corsica, 200 kilometers south of the Estere. So, a different scale, different type of impact, but all due to this important geological mobility. I came also with this watercolor because it's also an impact of hazard due to this collision and subduction. It's the Sicily. Sicily is a very uh, complex island from different point of view, but from a, vol a geological point of view, Sicily is on the both plate, on the north. Most of the island is on the European plate, Eurasian plate, and a part of the south south of Etna is on the African one. So this is exactly uh, a good example of uh, volcanic activity, dangerous volcanic activity at a prehistorical and historical scale of time due to this collision. And this is uh, the Vesuvius, the Vesuvius eruption with Pompeii in 79, just before the the destruction. This is Santorini, uh, Caldera, during, at the, at the, during the Bronze Age, and the destruction of the village of the Bronze Age period, but with limited tsunami impact. And this is, for example, uh, the plate mobility and the origin of uh, oscillation, tsunami oscillation and friction of the water column close to the sea. So the most vulnerable coasts are the lowland coast and not the cliffy and steep uh, coast. This is from Algeria. It's uh, a, a work that we have done with a PhD student from Alger University called Saïd Maouche. I, we were making some geological survey around Alger and we discovered these mega blocks of, uh, well, I don't remember exactly the volume, but it was something like uh, 
more than 20 cubic, uh, cubic square meter, uh, meter, cubic meter. So they are huge and they probably cannot be transported by uh, storm, storm waves, but mostly with uh, tsunami waves. By chance, these blocks present some bioconstruction, some ostrea, little oyster on the face, and we have been able to date them using radiocarbon with a lot of imprecision and uncertainty. But they were uh, historical blocks, huh? so there, there is a, a real important hazard in the IG uh, sector. So this is the tectonic mobility. The tectonic mobility is important because it has a lot of importance in terms of biological, of biological uh, organization of the Mediterranean Sea due to the desiccation between 5.8 and 5.3 million years. There is what we call the Messinian desiccation crisis. Gibraltar is closed in a few hundred years the sea level fall of, let's say, two kilometers, and, and the Mediterranean is almost dry. There is plenty of impacts. For example, there is a big paradox between Mediterranean Sea, which is probably from a Pangean uh, thinking, which is the oldest ocean, present-day oldest ocean, and in terms of tectonic, but in terms of biology, one of the most recent sea. So there is this paradox between biology, ecology, and geology. This is the first impact. The second impact is due to this sea level collapse. Sea level collapse. All the river create some canyons below the present sea level. So for example, below the Ebro, there is a canyon of two kilometers. Below the Camargue, below the Po, below the Nile Delta, below the Orontes Delta, below all the perimeter Danube, the Danube, I don't know, all the, the peri-Mediterranean Delta, there is Messinia Delta. And if you look at the Mediterranean landscape, you will be always fascinated by this important contrast between flat lowland, which correspond to sedimentary deposit from post messinian mainly Pliocene, Miocene, and whatever. So there is all this Paleo Canyon completely silted, full of sediment, silt, clay, sand, which contrasts very sharply with steep mountains, which are desiccated by canyons, mainly uh, originated due to the Messinian uh, crisis, more than five million years ago. So we are now in 2016, and the Mediterranean landscape is already shaped by this geological heritage. Well, with the canyon, you have, of course, the paleo cone, the paleo fan, the paleo fluvial <laughs> fan, the paleo delta, which has submerged, presently submerged by 2000. The Messinian the Messinian crisis, if I am correct, was mainly discovered by Italian because a uh, colleague from Italy, mainly Maria, Ch Maria Chita and the team with American and a few of French, they were so uh, impressed by the amount of salt deposit below the Mediterranean Sea. They had to understand, to explain why there is so many salt below the sea. In the only explanation is the desiccation of the water column. So this is one uh, image that I found in, uh, in, uh, it's in French, but you can understand. In red, it's what we call the gypsum evaporite, which are from, in, in red, before the Messinian, in purple, during the Messinian. So you can see that there is no one Mediterranean Sea during the Messinian period. There is a little restricted basin, the western basin, there is a Ionian basin and the eastern one. So only the deepest part of the Mediterranean Ocean were in like lagunal environments, hypersaline environments. Important thing is 
that Gibraltar is a very fragile strait. It was closed by tectonic, but it was reopened by geomorphology and fluvial erosion uh, by little river that destroys step by step, but what we call regressive erosion that reconnect the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea. Reconnect probably dramatically. There is a debate also. So, because the, during the Pliocene, the sea level was a little bit higher than today, because the fluvial erosion was important in Gibraltar, the Mediterranean Sea was refilled by oceanic water and full of water. And that you can see that here in Marseille, Lyon was a harbour, a Pliocene harbour of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Cairo was connected to the Mediterranean Sea via a big calanque, via a big creek, big steep creek. So these were important in terms of landscape evolution, but they don't represent a big volume to be silted. So very quickly, in a few, at a geological scale, in a few 10, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, all these submerged canyons were transformed in deltaic plain, the Rhone Valley, the Ebro Valley, the Po Valley, the Orontes Valley, the Nile Valley. And now, if you go, for example, in Camargue, if you want to drill for oil, gas, you will find <laughs> two kilometers of sediments. Okay, so we see we don't care. Yes, we care. Because we have to store uh, nuclear uh, waste. We have to store nuclear waste inside a protected paleo Messinian paleo canyon in a clay, homogeneous clay uh, environment. And it's the, let's say, not the perfect uh, jail for nuclear waste, but it's the best, uh, up to now, it's the best place to store nuclear deposits. So it's why, for in France, the nuclear society, the National Nuclear Society, was so interested to make geophysical survey and to analyze the southern part of the Rome River, because there is two kilometers of clay below the present surface and uh, sometimes three, four kilometers lateral. So it, it can be managed. The problem is after, the main problem is after to, the problem of the memory when you put some waste in the clay, okay. But are we able to think that in 2,000 years we will remember that we, will, we have put this waste? I don't think so. We will not remember. We will rediscover the waste later. Because it will take million years to that the radioactivity will vanish. So I, I, sh I, I show you some slides about tectonic mobility, the importance of tectonic mobility of the Mediterranean. I show you some slides about the, um, the sea level, the hydrological mobility. The hydrological mobility is not only the Messinian desiccation effect five million years ago. It's during the Quaternary, and we are now facing the prehistoric settlement of the Mediterranean. During the Quaternary, the, <laughs> the coast is subjected to translation and regression of about 100 meters high of amplitude uh, every 100,000 years. So there is oscillation. And this oscillation, for example, in Marseille, here is the is the Gulf of Marseille with the ancient Greek harbour studied by Anais and the Calanc coast. So between zero, present day zero, and 120 meters below present sea level, there is what we call the Plateau des Chèvres, uh, Plateau des Chèvres in English, Cap, Cap, Goat, Goat submerge plateau. <laughs> the Goat submerge plateau around 80 to 90 meters below present sea level is not full, but is presenting some prehistoric, mesolithic, uh, paleolithic artifacts of settlement. 
So, with the sea level oscillation, the quaternary sea level oscillation, one of the impact of the quaternary sea level oscillation is that we can say that most of the, pre the coastal prehistoric settlement of the Mediterranean Sea are below the sea, which is important. Because if you are dealing with the historical settlement, they are on the coast, most of them. Let's say between 10 meters below present day and 10 meters up. 10 meters below present, it's Naples. Naples Harbour, Pozzuoli Harbour are 10 meters below present sea level. So it's the deepest Roman harbour in the Mediterranean Sea. The highest Roman harbour in the Mediterranean Sea is in Crete, Western Crete, uplifted by a most a lot of earthquake, but mainly the earthquake of 365, and it's about seven meters. So there is an oscillation of let's say 15 meters between the deepest historical harbour and the highest uplifted historical harbour, uplifted by tectonics. But if you compare with prehistory, during prehistory, during Paleolithic period, you have some remains by 50 meters, 40 meters, maybe more. They are difficult to analyze because it's a prehistoric uh, settlement with not a lot of artifacts and not, of, not a lot of harbor works, but they are there. And for example, the British, maybe you know this name, Dogger. If you have heard about Dogger, if you, if you listen to the meteorology, meteorology program, it's a, it's a sector between France and England in the English Channel called Dogger and in Dogger the British farm huge and very extensive prehistoric settlements submerged by 40 meters. In Marseille we were very lucky because uh, in 90, it was in 91, in 91 was discovered by Jean Cosquer, Henri Cosquer, was discovered by Henri Cosquer, a half submerged cave. This half submerged cave is now called the Cosquer Cave, due to the man who discovered it. We have to dive about 40 meters below present sea level to go up and to breathe again fresh air in the cast of Marseille and be inside the half submerged cave. The half submerged cave is totally decorated by paintings, charcoal paintings that have been dated. There is two periods, there is an old period, there is a recent period, and the recent period is 18,000 18, years, 18, years before present. And the erosion of the painting is the present day sea level. So for the first time in Provence and in the Western Mediterranean Sea, we have been able, 25 years ago, to demonstrate that the present day sea level is the highest sea level since the last glacial maximum. It was important because, for example, in France, the biologists, mainly the paleontologists, were claiming of highest sea level 6,000 years BP during what they call the Atlantic period which was supposed to be more warm with an upper sea level, but in France, for sure, this is absolutely not the reality. So, what I told you, this is, for example, close to Nice, is Fréjus, and there is this <coughs> paleo messinian Valley, not Valley, paleo messinian Marine Bay, like an invagination, and it's uh, 10 kilometers long, and very quickly, after 5.3, this, this Paleo Marine Gulf is transformed in a deltaic plain and totally slow. We have always to remember the importance of mobility and metamorphosis of landscape at different times. This, ex for this example of Fréjus is due to the reopening of the Mediterranean Sea the Atlantic Sea, so it's due to the a static sea level. Let's say a sea level 10 meters above the present one during the Pliocene. But what is the main forcing agent of this coastal propagation? 
this constant progradation is due to sedimentary input, is due to sedimentary activity, to geomorphological erosion. So you, you are not increased. By chance, in southern France, there is very small tectonic, except at the Italian border, close to Nice, with the Alpine uh, erection, or in Pyrenees. But outside these two uh, Spanish border and Italian border, there is mainly no tectonic, very little limited tectonic activity. Um, for, for example, for Kamal, you can see that since 7,000 years BP, the marine, the marine gulf of Kamal was transformed by fluvial activity, which was its main natural driver. Was, was characterized by delta progradation, sedimentary elevation, building step by step the present day uh, Rome delta morphology. And for example, one of our colleagues, Claude Vella, since let's say 20 years, is dedicated his scientific life to, to re recognize the paleo shore, they then accurately using optics in the OSL and C14 dating of shells, remains, pit, and step by step he is suggesting a very dynamic, uh, a very dynamic coastline, coastline evolution. I, I have spoken in this introduction of the introduction about tectonic mobility. I have spoken about a little bit of uh, hydrological mobility, sea level mobility. We cannot forget there is a climate acti mobility activity. For example, the last period that was important in terms of uh, climate mobility is what we call the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age it's between the. Uh, there is a debate also. Let's say modern period. So between the. 15th to 19th century. It's something like, if I am correct, one degree minus one degree, but the impact is very important. You are in Arles. Arles, now it's a, a bridge built by Eiffel. Gustave Eiffel who built the Eiffel Tower in Paris. It's a bridge, and we are in 1929, so we are after the end of the Little Ice Age, and you can see the road, the, the delta, the, the river, the Rome River, which is almost totally frozen, and you can see, for example, one person who is trying to cross the river by, by, by himself, walking on, on, the, on the frozen Rome River. So this um, this uh, third mobility, climatic mobility, is also important to integrate inside the geographic heritage, and there is a. a Number four, forcing agent, which is Anthropocene, which is the human society influence. And for example, I came here with this watercolor that we make uh, from uh, it's um, it's a very nice uh, um, stone graving of uh, from Bedolina. It's called Bedolina map. You can find a lot of information on the internet. It's from Valcanonica. Camonica, or Camonica, I don't remember, in Lombardia, northern Italy. And you can see, for example, some field, some crops, some uh, paths. It's Bronze Age, so it's, uh, let's say, it's difficult to date, of course. But they have made a few uh, excavations close to these sites, and it's, let's say, it's 5,000 years BP, 3,000 years BC. And you can see some people. With tools, you can see some. Uh, they, they interpret this like granaries, maybe granaries, planting. So there is land use since Neolithic, intensive land use and intensive human intervention on the natural evolution. So climate, tectonic, sea level, and society, which are the four main components of the system. Of the landscape system. And, and I show 
the brother of this water color. It's Marseille. So Marseille, what is important? Let's say, what is important in Marseille? Sea level rise since the Greek colonization. The Greeks arrived in 600 years BC. Sea level rise of about 70 centimeters. Well, it's not much, eh? 70 centimeters in 2060 years. Sea level rise, but paradoxically, because there is some sedimentary input, the harbor was restricted about uh, one third of its original form. So you can see that sea level rise, but the harbor was shifted due to sedimentary input. Sedimentary input from anthropogenic origin. There is no fluvial system. It's sediments from land use, it's sediments from waste, it's sediment because the road in ancient Greek and Roman architecture are in dust, they are not all paved, houses are not all in stone, in marble, most of them are in, uh, are in bricks, cooked or not cooked, there is plenty of sediment which is uh, introduced step by step, period by period in the ancient harbor. It's the same for Toulon, where we have walked in the past, and below the city hall of Toulon, they, we excavate in the, at the end of the 80s uh, this, uh, this Roman harbor. The same also in uh, in uh, in Rome on the on the Tiber Delta in close to Ostia there is what is the, called Portus which is the name for, for the Roman harbor of Port and we must remember that for example there is something very important in the connection between nature and culture it's what we call technological progress. What is a technological progress? The technological, one example of technological progress is 2,200 years, the invention of, of the use of pozzolana by the Romans to produce hydraulic cement. What is it, hydraulic cement? It's ash from the pozzolana ash, it's sand, it's uh, broken, uh, broken limestone, and it can be uh, put in water and it will be transformed in cement in water. So this absolutely fantastic uh, discovery to make cement in water allowed the Roman to build harbour offshore to manage artificial harbour. Before this period it was very difficult to settle offshore harbour. Yes, you can settle them by blocks, but they were smaller they were difficult to manage in this way. It was like an industrial uh, way to restyle, to make an artificial deformation of the shoreline. So, what I want to say is that the intervention of the human society is, of course, step by step uh, more and more intense. For example, there is concerning the cement, there is two inventions. There is the invention by the Roman of the hydraulic cement using pozzolana. It was used by the Byzantine, so let's say up to the 13th century. After it was, with the collapse of the Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, it was lost for generation. And it was finally re, re, rediscovered by different techniques, by the British, and they call it the Portland cement. So in 3,000 years, we, it, it took us 500 years to rediscover a Roman techniques. Not only, but okay, not all of us, but most of us, you are dealing with the coast, and you, it's the conclusion of the conclusion. What I want to say is the coast, okay, we are coastal archaeologists, coastal geologists, coastal geomorphologists, but the coast is the reflect of the fluvial system, because the coast, except in hyper-arid country, the coast is at the base level. What is it, the base level? It's the sedimentary base level. It, it's where the sediments will, for sure, deposit. The base level is one of the most important concepts of geomorphology. So, when you analyze the coast, you have always to 
analyze the fluvial system upstream. And the fluvial system upstream, for example in Provence, was, since the Roman period, was totally transformed in terms of fluvial transit and water transits by the water management. Here I came with the watercolor of Pont-Gar, a famous Roman bridge close to Avignon. And uh, the Gar River, part of the Gar River fluvial discharge and sedimentary transit was transferred via the uh, aqueduct. Not only the water supply and the water management, but also the soil management. In this watercolor, we are in Delos. In Delos, Greek and French archaeologists were lucky enough to work not on the temple or the forgotten uh, arbor, but to work on something more small, but maybe more important for us. It's the dating of the terrace, of the agricultural, how do you call it in English? Step, you, have, you understand step, <laughs> for sure. And in Greek, how do you call this? In Italian, banchina, terras, terras. Okay, terras. To say, to say, to say, if I am not the word, but there is also soil management at a millionaire scale since the Neolithic. All the pedological cycle of the soil and agricultural construction and artificial landscape is managed by society using donkeys to every 20 years to put the brown soil which was eroded by a collapsing terrace or runoff or fluvial activity up and down, up and down. So it's important also to integrate the land use, the agricultural land use, inside the watershed uh, activity. And conclusion of conclusion, it's what is, because what is our um, project? Okay, we have a PhD, a master, but we have something more important. What is the philosophy of the presence of the human society along the Mediterranean shoreline. There is not so many options. One option is the Spanish option, Benidorm option, Alicante option. It's super urbanization, landscape destruction, hyper-artificialization, hyper-pollution. But most of us, we are not so enthusiastic about this uh, landscape destruction and ecological destruction, and there is not a lot of future for this. At the opposite, we can say, ah, we are in Venice, it's beautiful. Maybe it's worse. It's worse in Venice. Why is it worse? Because it's more artificial. For example, Venice lost, I think, maybe I'm not correct, you need to correct me, more than half of its population in 60 years, the city of Venice. There is, except tourism, there is no activity. It's difficult to live, price are very rich. It's, everything is complicated, so it looks nice from a landscape point of view, but let's say from a human perspective, it's maybe worse. It's what we call museification, transformation of a city into a museum. Disneyland, Venice, Disneyland. Okay, so we don't want Alicante, and we don't want uh, Venice. Yeah, we would like Venice, but it, 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 there is no economic... Uh, it's impossible. To, to so we have to face these two models, two anti-models, to try to find a solution for present day and a perspective for the future. And this was the introduction of the introduction.